Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about static frame, an immutable alternative to pandas. All right, so you might first consider why you need an alternative to pandas. Um, well, to answer that question, I really have to talk about uh, my work and the context of my work. I produce a production back-end financial systems. I Im implement libraries and uh, APIs that need to last years. Um, and I'm not often doing ad hoc data exploration. In fact, uh, I am often producing these production systems. So I favor packages with minimal uh, additional dependencies, consistent stable APIs with low upgrade costs, and interfaces that reduce opportunities for error. So I've been using, sorry, I'm confused here. Okay, so I've been using pandas in production since 2013, so I've been using it for a long time. It has contributed greatly to my productivity. Uh, it provides critical functionality for working with tabular data, uh, for processing, grouping, and extracting that data, and efficient uh, column addition. In fact, we use data frames very frequently in data pipelines where we're uh, using addition of columns as logging incremental transformations of data as we proceed through the table. Uh, but from time to time, I wonder if pandas is really the right tool for my work. Um, and in fact, I found that in many cases it's not. Uh, so let's consider what I need in an alternative. So the core requirements of an alternative is that we have pandas-like approaches to selecting and transforming one and two-dimensional labeled data. This is uh, really a critical feature, as well as robust handling of missing data and heterogeneous types. These are features of pandas that we all take for granted and uh, are extremely valuable. Uh, we need NumPy level performance, and for my work, I need uh, to process data that fits in memory. I don't have uh, big data concerns. Working within memory generally works fine for me. Now, going further than those core requirements, we can look at some sort of extended requirements that we'll talk about as we move uh, forward. Uh, I'm looking for more narrow and consistent interfaces, uh, tighter alignment with NumPy, and immutable data. Uh, the value and importance of all of these I will uh, discuss as we proceed. So, uh, static frame is that alternative. It is a Python 3 wrapper around NumPy, and I say that explicitly because I'm not trying to do what NumPy does. I don't have the time or the resources for that. I'm really wrapping uh, NumPy. There's no Python 2 support, and the only dependency at this time is NumPy. Uh, it borrows but narrows many components of the Pandas API. It is not a drop-in replacement. Some, some things are similar, but many things are different. Uh, it's built around immutable NumPy's arrays. I've been developing it since May of 2017. Uh, the first release was in May 2018 of this year. So that's uh, what we're, the core thing we're looking for. There's some things we're not looking for. Um, a static frame will not be the most powerful and flexible tool. That is, that is not my goal. Uh, Pandas has the broader goal of becoming the most powerful and flexible open source data analysis manipulation tool available in any language. That's a fantastic goal, and that has provided tremendous uh, benefit to the Python community. Uh, but that power and flexibility comes at a cost. And uh, you know, sometimes that cost uh, it makes it uh, challenging to produce these more narrow interfaces that, that I'm looking for. Now, you may not need an alternative, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, for many tasks, Pandas is still the best tool. Uh, it has outstanding performance. It has a breadth of support and integration. So for many tasks, Pandas will, of course, be uh, exactly the right thing for what you're doing. Uh, however, for production libraries and APIs, uh, an alternative may be better. Of course, with static frame, you can easily go back and forth. So I have methods to go to and from Pandas. So you can dabble and use a mixed environment if that's your preference. Okay, so after covering a little bit of the motivation of how Static Frame came to be, I'm going to focus on some of the differences, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on immutability, because that's one of the key differences, and that's really one of the key things that drove uh, my exploration in the creation of Static Frame. Um, and then we'll talk about a few other differences, look at performance, and finish up. So let's talk about immutability. Uh, concerns about immutability are not a new concern. Uh, in the classic structure and interpretation of computer programs from 1979, which I know you have all have read, um, uh, the authors uh, point out that 
uh, you know, assignment as a type of mutation, they point out that in contrast to functional programming, programming that makes extensive use of assignment is known as imperative programming. In addition to raising complications about computational models, programs written in imperative style are susceptible to bugs that cannot occur in functional programs. Uh, this is often uh, mentioned in passing, but this is a very nice, succinct uh, statement of that uh, fact. So how do we avoid mutation in Python? Uh, well, we can use native immutable containers. We have a few of them in Python, just a few. We have a tuple and a frozen set. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Um, the uh, series and frame, however, are types of mappings, and we do not actually have any immutable mappings in Python. The uh, frozen dict pep416 was rejected, um, and so we're left without any immutable mappings in the standard Python library. Of course, the name tuple is kind of a mapping, but it doesn't support arbitrary keys, so that doesn't really count. Um, so how do we avoid mutation in Python? Well, we can use these native immutable containers, or we can use mutable containers, but always make defensive copies. That is, we have to accept that we don't know if other references have a handle to our objects, so we make a copy of them, a defensive copy, before making any changes. So that's mutation in Python, but what about avoiding mutation in NumPy? Well, NumPy starts out pretty much already there in that we have arrays of fixed size and fixed type. We cannot uh, change the size of a NumPy array, we cannot change its type. But array values are mutable by default. Well, it turns out we can get around this uh, by an excellent feature of NumPy. Um, in my example here, I'm going to create a simple NumPy array. This is going to be a range of uh, 10 integers and I'm going to mutate a value. I'm going to set uh, index 3 to 300, and we see the array has been mutated. Now, we can <laughs> mutate an array to make it immutable by setting the writable flag to false. Once we've done this, if we try to change a value in the array, we get an exception. And that's pretty nice, because uh, with this, we can build immutability in static frame. Uh, NumPy provides the core immutability. Uh, it is circumventable. I just showed you how to turn it on and off, but this is not about security. This is about coding style and a coding style that reduces opportunities for errors. Um, so all operations in static frame return new containers of immutable arrays. There are no in-place operations, uh, and many lightweight containers can share references to the same immutable data. This is one of the huge benefits of this approach, is that I can have blocks of NumPy arrays shared across multiple frames without ever doing a copy because they cannot be mutated. Um, now, the core classes within static frame are uh, also immutable. Uh, the attributes on those classes are not mutable. Uh, the, uh, they are defined with slots, so all the classes are slotted. You can't add arbitrary um, attributes. Uh, series and frame classes are immutable in both dimensions. We do have a special class called frameGO, which is a grow-only frame that adds uh, columns to a frame. So you can grow only, you can add columns to a frame. Uh, and that's sort of kind of this mixture of mutability and immutability, but is one that's quite useful. So, uh, in order to really uh, get a sense of why immutability is so valuable, we really need to look at an example. Um, because understanding why immutability is important really takes looking at architecture of code. So I'm going to give you a very contrived and a little bit silly example. Uh, please bear with me. But through this example, hopefully we'll be able to see why immutability is so important. So we have a system that produces those giant vinyl banner signs, right? It's a fully automated system that prints out these giant vinyl banners. It's very exciting. Uh, multiple engineers work uh, into this system and produce uh, routines that map jobs to colors. They're not exciting banners, they just have one color. Um, these jobs are submitted to printers via frame, where each row is a print job, and each row defines a color and a printer to print to. Now, these are going to end up as columns in a big table. Um, so there's a common API that our engineers use called AVB Engine, and uh, this provides some utilities like a mapping of colors to CMYK values. Numerous frames from engineers are concatenated and then sent to printers. So this is our hypothetical example. I know this is contrived and a little silly, but it'll give us something to work with. So how does this work? So we can create our AVB engine, and say we have a data frame that has our jobs. We have a color column and a printer column. We're going to print color on our high contrast printer, and we can use that engine to add CMYK columns. That's very nice. 
We look at our data frame after adding the columns, and we see now we have a column for each of C, M, Y, and K. Uh, finally, we can submit our jobs to our printers and our uh, fantastic monochromatic uh, vinyl banners are printed and, and we're very excited. Um, so that's our scenario. Now, before we get into mutation, we've got to take a tiny detour to understand a little bit about color systems. Many of you already know this. Uh, there's many parametric representations for color. There's RGB and CMYK. RGB is as screens project. CMYK is as printers print. That you probably know. You may not know that printed black is not always 100% K. Uh, printers can actually uh, add additional colors to the black to get a richer or different black. That's just some context to frame uh, what we're going to do here. So let's look at the implementation of this uh, AVB in Panda. So what we're going to do here, again, this is extremely simple, is we're going to have a data frame that has as its index C, M, Y, and K. And we're going to populate columns for colors. So this is going to be our color mapping that our engineers are going to use. Now, in practice, we might have many, many, many more colors here. Uh, we're just using four right now. So each of these values are C, M, Y, and K. And we have a utility method called add C, M, Y, K columns, which is going to go through each of the C, Y, M, and K, and going to populate a column on the passed in frame with the color for each component. So we're going to iterate over C, M, Y, and K. We're going to produce a column for each. For each, we're going to call apply on the color series. And we're going to pull from the mapping just the colors, the C, M, Y, K, and one at a time for the color in the mapping. This is the row. This is the column. So this is how this thing works. So we have our AVB engine. We have our map of colors. We produce a jobs data frame. Uh, this has just one job. We add our C, M, Y, K columns. And we're ready to go. OK, so that's uh, the basic uh, tool that we're going to describe here. Now, we have two engineers, uh, Tom and John. And our two engineers are um, uh, both producing uh, frames, uh, one with green, red, and black, and the other with green, blue, and black. And they are targeting different printers. So Tom is targeting a strong mid-tone printer, and John is targeting a high contrast printer. Uh, they both add their CMYK columns, and they're done. To get the results, we concatenate the two frames, and we send that to the printer. And that gives us what we expect. So we have uh, six jobs queued up here uh, for two different printers. Both of them are using 100% K for black. So we find out that uh, black was insufficient. So uh, Tom goes and he prints his output, and he finds out that on his strong mid-tone printer, uh, the black is insufficient. So Tom looks to the internet to see if he can solve this problem, and he finds out that you can use other types of black, that you can mix other colors into your black to get a richer black, a cool black, a warm black. There's a whole menu of blacks. So Tom does something quite natural. He gets the shared engine right here, and he changes black. He says black is going to be 60% uh, cyan, 60% magenta, 40% yellow, and 100% black. And he's going to change that right there. And then his code, he doesn't have to change any of his other code. In fact, this is probably why he was motivated to do it this way, because he could just make this one change, and none of his code had to change. That's great. Uh, what's going to happen to our results? Well, Tom got the rich black that he wanted, but John also got it. John did not want rich black. In fact, he's using a high contrast printer. If he uses this rich black, uh, it might oversaturate the paper and cause some sort of the vinyl and cause some printing disaster. Uh, so this is not what we want. This is mutation gone astray. So mutation of shared state is a danger and a common source of bugs in our code. It leads to unintended side effects, it introduces order dependency, and it forces users to make defensive copies, which generally are inefficient. So how can we improve this with static frame? Um, so here's the implementation of the same thing now in static frame. What we're going to do here is we're going to start with a mutable dictionary. We're going to build up our mapping in our mutable dictionary, and then we're going to put that in a static frame frame object. Now, this is very much like our pandas data frame object, but it is fixed in size, fixed in columns, fixed in rows, and all of the values are immutable. The add CMYK columns function is very similar. It's going to take in a frame geo. This is the grow only frame. We're going to add columns to this frame. So we need a grow only frame. And we're going to do basically the same thing. Notice that we don't have an apply method. We have an iter element 
on the series method that then has an apply function, and we can apply the same function to give us the values for each column of C, M, Y, and K. So how does this work? Well, uh, it looks pretty much the same. Um, this is our first view of what a static frame frame looks at, and there's some differences in how we present the frame. So if we look at this mapping, now we see a couple of differences. We see that the type of the frame, the type of the index columns, and the index index is given, and the underlying NumPy container type is given as well, the data type for the contained in the NumPy arrays. So Using this is pretty much the same. Uh, a user can go and uh, get a jobs uh, frame, geo, and we can see what that looks like there. We can add the jobs to, uh, we can pass the jobs frame to the add CMYK columns and get our CMYK columns added to the frame. So this works pretty well. Uh, let's see what happens to uh, Tom's code with this new approach. So Tom's uh, code hasn't changed pretty much. Uh, except for that he, need, he needed to update this to be a frame GO. He did that, and he wants to continue to use his rich black so he doesn't change anything else, and he goes and runs his code, and what happens? He gets an exception. You cannot mutate the frame. Uh, he's trying to add a column or mutate an existing column, and frame object does not support item assignment. He can't do it. Okay, so that's good for John in particular. Um, but Tom is creative and uh, will not stop there. So instead, he tries to use an iLock call on the series given from the frame and mutate that. Uh, well, that also produces an ex exception. Uh, there is no series mutation. Uh, we can't actually edit the values in the series with an iLock call. Now, Tom is uh, undeterred. He knows that when he's used pandas, sometimes he knows that he can go in there and mutate an underlying NumPy array and see that mutation in his series or frame. It's this kind of sketchy backdoor, and he really wants this to work. So he's going to go and try and get the values, uh, the actual NumPy array from the underlying uh, series and mutate that value directly, and he's sure this will work. But of course it does not, because our NumPy arrays are immutable, the value error, the assignment destination is read-only, tells us that we cannot actually mutate the values in the frame. So that's good. Fighting mutation uh, is what I want to do, and uh, static frame gives us a way to do that. Now, no approach in Python is perfect, uh, but I believe that reasonable barriers to doing bad things is good. <laughs> um, the grow-only structures that I've shown here offer a sort of practical compromise where we can append columns. The underlying NumPy arrays are still immutable, but we can use some idioms where we add columns. And as I mentioned, that idiom is one that we use quite a bit in my own work. Um, what's nice about that is if we're appending or extending arrays, uh, we do not have to copy them if they're immutable. So we've handled one type of mutation. We've handled a value mutation that's going on uh, in this function, but there's other types of mutations. There's mutations of the passed in argument and mutation of uh, the container that's being passed in. So let's get rid of those two. So this is, as our implementation now stands, we use a static frame to hold the mapping. This is fixed in size and fixed in value. Um, and we look at our add CMYK columns function. Here, this is taking our frame GO. Um, and we're adding columns to the past in argument. We're mutating our past in argument. And in the narrow case we have here, this might be acceptable. But again, uh, we know that mutation is a source of errors, and this may lead to surprising outcomes. So we can do better. In this alternative implementation, the function formerly known as add CMYK columns becomes get CMYK columns. And we're going to pass it in not an entire frame, but just what we need, just the colors represented in an immutable series. What we're going to return is also an immutable frame. We're not going to add columns. We're just going to produce a new frame using a generator right here, which is going to yield pairs of the CMYK code and the array. And we're going to use that to build our frame, an immutable frame that we're going to return. Now, this is actually quite efficient because the immutable NumPy array that we create here can be used in this frame without copying because it's immutable. We can just take that frame. We do not have to copy it as we use it to build our frame, which is quite nice. So designing with immutable data uh, gives us many benefits. Uh, 
our function arguments now expose minimal dependencies. We just pass what we need. Functions never mutate their arguments, and functions return new immutable containers. All of these things give advantages to our overall architecture. OK, so now for the client code, uh, user John here, uh, he, using this new approach where he's not mutating his past in arguments, uh, will um, take his data frame, his uh, static frame rather, and has one frame for jobs and another frame for CMYK value. And then he simply concatenates them at the end. So this approach is much better than mutating a past in argument. This approach is also efficient because with static frame, this concatenation, assuming the indices align, this concatenation does not have to copy underlying data. Because the underlying uh, NumPy arrays are immutable, they do not have to be copied in this concatenation. We can produce a new frame that shares references to the underlying data, which gives us great opportunities for efficiency. So architecture and mutability are linked. Um, avoiding mutation leads to different architectures. Architectures are less error prone when uh, internal state is not mutated, functions do not mutate their arguments, and APIs return handles to immutable data. And each of those things we've done in the refactoring of this code here. Now, assignment is a problem. Not just because assignment causes mutation, but because in pandas, we have this rich uh, way of, sp of defining assignment. We, have these, we can assign to expressions for slices. We can assign to selection lists. We can assign to Boolean arrays. And this is quite powerful and useful. And I don't want to give that up. So we retain that interface by avoiding mutation. And we do it with using function calls instead of the assignment operator. So if I want to use the assignment like idiom, here's my original frame. I want to assign to column C a transformed version of column C. I don't use the assignment operator. I use this assign attribute. I select what I want, and I pass in, as a function call, the changed values, which is what I'm doing here. And we get a new column with scaled values. So the assign attribute exposes the selection interface and then provides a callable that we pass in the value that we want to change. And we get out of this a new frame. Now, in some cases, this could be very inefficient, but uh, the static frame will copy as little possible. Uh, it, will, uh, it definitely has to change the column or the values that we're mutating, but other components of the underlying managed data do not have to be copied and can be shared in the new frame that's returned. Um, another example of this, here we're using an LOC call. Uh, we're selecting uh, row E and column C, a slice of C to the end. And we're going to just assign a new value there for the four colors. And we can see that we get a new frame with those new values defined. OK, so we've talked about immutability and why that's such a key difference and why that, that was really the key motivation for static frame. There's a number of other differences, which I'll go over more quickly. With static frame, we have a goal of having more narrow interfaces. That means removing redundancies, and of course, the Zen of Python reminds us that there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do things. And that's a big part of what I mean by more narrow interfaces. Uh, we want to reduce function parameters and favor more specialized functions. So we'll look at two small examples of this and how static frame deviates from pandas. So in pandas, you can ac access a column. Uh, here's our initial data frame. We can access a column with the get item syntax. We can also access a column with an attribute. Now I'm sure uh, this was very convenient uh, at the time, but this convenience is, leads to problems. Uh, we can set a name attribute on a data frame uh, that's not a column, of course, and get back that string. We can have a column name name, and that's a proper series. What do we get if we do engine.map.name? I can't remember. <laughs> and that's a problem. Um, get item is a similar case. So get item can be used as a column selector. Generally, we think of get item as a column selector. If we want a column, we want the column red, we call get item with the string red. If we want a row, we generally use an LOC selection. We select row Y. Um, but get item can sometimes be used as a row selector in pandas. If I provide just row indices to the get item uh, selector, I'm not going to get anything out. That doesn't work. But if I happen to provide a Boolean array of size equal to the height of the table, this actually works. I can actually select rows out of the get item interface. Um, this, of course, is redundant with using an LLC call. 
So in static frame, we strive to have consistent specialized interfaces. Uh, there's no attribute access to columns. You have to use getItem. Uh, getItem is only a column selector. You can never get rows out of getItem. .lock is only a row or row column pair selector. Um, this leads to more numerous narrow functions with less parameter configuration. Okay, next up, another important difference between pandas and static frame is that we enforce uh, unique indices. So in pandas, uh, it has this really interesting feature that I can take a uh, frame and I can take a column, here the column blue, which has only two values for four rows, and I can set that as the index. Now that's really uh, interesting, but I've never needed this. I've never needed this. Every time this has happened, this has been an error, something I've done wrong, something I did not want. Uh, maybe others have application for this, but I've never needed it. Uh, you can disable it with the verify integrity option, but by default, this is false. I find that undesirable. In static frame, uh, index integrity is never optional. So all indices have to be unique. Um, next up is deviations from NumPy. Now, uh, the, uh, with static frame, again, this is trying to be a fairly lightweight package. I don't have opinions about the things that NumPy has already decided, and I don't want to create opinions for those things. So in NumPy, if we create an array of single characters, we get a single character type. In pandas, if we create an array of single characters, we get an object type. Now, there's probably good reasons for doing this. If I want an object type, though, I want to specify it. In static frame, if we give an uh, create an array out of single characters, we get a single character type. Calculations implemented in NumPy also will deviate sometimes from pandas. Um, so for in NumPy, standard deviation of three numbers by default gives you 0.816. If you take a panda series and you take the standard deviation of this, you get 1.0. Now, it's no mystery why this is different. It happens to do with the delta degrees of freedom argument being set to a different default. But I don't need a different default. I don't have an opinion about what is the right default. I'm happy to rely on NumPy for that. So in static frame, we get the standard NumPy default for standard deviation. So uh, in static frame, we try to stay relatively close to NumPy. Um, now, Next up, we have a static frame exposes a whole range of specialized iterators for function application. So looking at pandas, we have a couple of functions that allow us to iterate over elements. We can iter rows, we can iter tuples, we can do group by, and we have a number of functions for up, uh, applying functions to iterated values. We have apply map, which iterates over individual values in a table, and we have apply, which we can use to iterate over rows or columns. We can change what apply iterates or passes to functions with this raw argument. We can set it to false to get series. We can set it to true to get arrays. So with static frame, we've taken a completely different approach with iterators and function application. The type is determined by the function, not by a parameter. parameter. Uh, the iterated type is given by a different function, either an element, array, a name tuple, or a series. And iterating over values or items, that is key and value pairs, is also distinguished by function, not by parameter. We have access arguments, and iteration is directly linked to function application. So our iterators are used for function application. They're perfectly tied together, which I think is also uh, very nice. The cost of this is that we end up with a ton of functions. So we have iter element, we have iter array, iter tuple, iter series, and iter group. So these are the family of iterators on a frame. We know clearly what type we're going to pass to our functions uh, or what we're going to get back out of these iterators uh, by the name of the function. We have another version of each of these functions that is an items version, which returns pairs of the index and the array, tuple, series, or whatever we want to get out of these guys. So to see an example of this, we can have our frame, we can iter series and we can get one series out by axis zero, we can iter array by axis one and get a nice array out of this. What, where this gets really uh, nice is when we apply functions uh, to those iterables. So all these iter functions return a powerful interface and each of those interfaces has various apply functions on them. We can apply a function, we can use a, a multiprocessing uh, um, to do what's called apply pool using uh, Python's uh, multiprocessing uh, APIs. We can uh, get lazy generators of applications with apply iter and apply iter items. So we can then use this. Here we're taking our frame, we're iterating over each element, and we're transforming the, the floats into strings and removing the zeros. Here we see quite clearly that our function application is applied to our iterators. Those two things are always linked. 
and I think that's quite nice. Looking at a more complex example, if we want to transform our CMYK values to RGB values, we can have a function that takes color name tuples and returns the hexadecimal string for that color. So here's our frame. We call uh, iter tuple, give it access one, and pass our function, and we get a series back with our hexadecimal values. So static frame exposes a whole family of specialized iterators. Uh, you can iterate over just what you need. Uh, you have variable access for all iterators. You can get a series named tuple or array depending on what you need and what you want to pay for. Uh, you can iterate over values or pairs. And function application is always linked to the iterator. That's really the key design choice here. OK, so I'm sure by now you're wondering, is static frame as fast as pandas? Uh, well, the answer is sometimes, sometimes not. Um, right now, static frame is pure Python and NumPy. There is no C libraries, there's no Cython, there's no Numba, there's just Python and NumPy. And our performance evaluations to this point are very narrow on isolated features. Uh, it may not be relevant to your work. For your work, you need to look at the larger context. So these are uh, artificial. Um, we will use the ratio to pandas as a way to give us a good benchmark. So we're going to look at a couple examples uh, using the following environment. So let's check these out. So here we have a uniformly typed array, uh, sorry, a uniformly typed frame of floats. We're going to have uh, 10 uh, string indices. We're going to have an uh, index of 10,000 values, 1,000 columns, and we're going to have random floats in there. So we're going to create our frame. We're going to do some function application. Uh, and then we're going to both by array and by series. In this case, we're going to select a subset of columns and a subset of indices. Uh, I'm, this is the static frame code. I'm not showing you the corresponding pandas code, but it looks kind of similar. So we can see that our loading of the frame is 18 times slower. That's a little sad. Uh, but uh, function application is all very good, uh, or if not, sometimes better. Um, we see some particular benefits. So for example, concatenating subsets of that very large frame here by taking two different subset selections from the frame and then concatenating them together, here we see a marked improvement over pandas. And that very likely is due to the, uh, that we do not actually have to copy the underlying data. So with a mixed type frame, the results are a little bit different. So here I have a frame that's built with combinations of random floats and random integers can, can uh, transform to booleans. And I'm going to produce a frame of the same size uh, with floats and booleans and alternating columns. I'm going to create that frame and then I'm going to take subsets and sum them up. So here, static frame does very well. Uh, creation is about the same and uh, our subset selection is uh, close or faster. Finally, data loading. So here we're going to get a very large uh, CSV of traffic uh, incident data and we're going to write that to disk and we're going to load that into a frame. Uh, in a static frame you do that with an alternative constructor on the frame class. How do we do here? Not so good. So uh, this takes seven, eight seconds in pandas, 113 seconds in static frame. That is painful. Uh, so right now, this is just pure NumPy. Uh, this is an opportunity for improvement. We're just using NumPy CSV uh, reader here, which many of you know is, is significantly slower than pandas. Uh, so what are our alternatives? Well, we can read JSON data. If we read JSON data, here are a modest table from a JSON uh, API, we're actually uh, quite close to uh, pandas. Uh, and there's another alternative. If we just use pandas to read the CSV and then use static frames from pandas, uh, it's a trick, but that gets us to nearly identical performance. So that's an opportunity for improvement, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. So static frame is uh, definitely in alpha stage, but it is pretty useful. Uh, the core functionality is nearly complete. We have uh, releases and documentation at the usual places. Uh, we have uh, some issues on GitHub that you can uh, check out. Uh, Static Frame has been developed within research affiliates uh, where we're dedicated to continued development of this tool. Um, we have started small scale integration of Static Frame in limited applications and we're starting case studies of large scale use of Static Frame. Our roadmap includes working on input and output support. So that's really, I think, the next big thing that we need to bring to Static Frame, including an implementation of from CSV that is uh, comparable to Pandas. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for performance tuning. As I mentioned, at this point, there is none. Um, and probably by a year from now, I think we might be ready for a 1.0 release with a stable API. 
So we're looking for contributors, as many projects are. Uh, I encourage you all to try it out, uh, find any issues, implement some features, uh, give, me, give us some performance information. I would be fascinated to see what you guys find. Um, before I conclude, I have to acknowledge the investment systems teams, my colleagues. Uh, this, I, while I coded nearly all of Static Frame, uh, I benefited greatly from the uh, review and commentary of my colleagues. Um, and I also want to point out that uh, this was developed within the context of open source development at Research Affiliates, my employer, and we've produced many uh, interesting Python packages, which I encourage uh, you guys to check out. So you can find our code on uh, GitHub, and I'm interested if any of you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Um, do you support any CRIPI operations when we set against static frame? Yes. And is, uh, is that also immutable, the return to object? Yes. Object? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't, uh, I forget how my performance is doing there, but I think we're kind of close. I think we're reasonably close. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> no elaborations. <laughs>